Hello, my name is Dr. Aidan Elliott, and this is the Complete Guide to Shakespeare. The theme of family pervades almost everything that happens in Romeo and Juliet, but it's a force that both unifies and divides. It unifies because it gives the characters a joint identity and something to belong to, but it divides because by belonging to one family, you mark yourself out as different from other families. In this case, if you are a Capulet, you find yourself needing to hate the Montagues because of an ancient grudge. When a fight breaks out at the beginning of the play, Tybalt resists Mervolio's pleas for peace, saying, What? Drawn and talk of peace? I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. The language here is revealing. Tybalt sees swords drawn and asks why peace is even being discussed. There is no possibility in his mind that Benvolio might be genuinely wanting peace. Add to this his repetition of the word hate. He hates peace. The Montagues and Benvolio, as much as he hates hell, the place of eternal damnation. There is nothing one could hate more. And this establishes Tybalt as the epitome of the ultra-loyalist Capulet. But this hatred of the Montagues is not just shown by Tybalt and the Capulet men. When Juliet discovers that Romeo is a Montague, she says, My only love sprung from my only hate. Juliet is only 13. Yet the only thing she knows is that she hates the Montague family. But notice also that Juliet talks in absolutes. She now also only loves one person, Romeo. And ironically, in this language of extremes, lies some hope. Love, the polar opposite of hate, eventually becomes the means by which the families will heal the rift between them. But love itself faces a major obstacle from the second aspect of family in this play, its patriarchal structure patriarchy being a system where the male is head of the family. As the patriarch, Capulet has control over who his daughter can or cannot marry. An example of patriarchy in action comes at the beginning of the play, where we hear Paris asking about the possibility of marrying Juliet, and Capulet tells him, Let two more summers wither in their pride, ere we may think her ripe to be a bride. At a very basic level, this simply means Capulet wants two more years to pass before Juliet marries. But note two things here from the language. One is the use of summer and ripening in relation to Juliet. She is in a phase of incomplete growth and not yet physically ready for marriage. He uses similar language a few lines later when he refers to young women as fresh fennel buds. Now implicit in this language is the idea that women are beautiful delicate and ripening for a purpose, to marry and to produce children. Second, notice the phrase wither in their pride. Here, pride means the best state of something, as in the pride of youth. Capulet wants Juliet to enjoy two of her best years before she is made a wife and a mother. But the use of the word pride here also foreshadows the argument he will have with Juliet in Act 3, where he attacks her for being proud, this time in the sense of being arrogant and self-important. Now, shortly after this, we hear Juliet agreeing to the basic idea of an arranged marriage with Paris, saying, I'll look to like, if looking, liking move, but no more deep will I indart mine eye than your consent gives strength to make it fly. Juliet will take a look at Paris, and if she likes what she sees and her parents agree, she will marry him. But notice the structure of the language. It's in the future tense, I will look to like, and then the conditional, if, by looking, she is emotionally moved to like Paris, then that makes a match between them possible. This suggests that she has a mind of her own, and has a degree of personal choice about who she will marry. But she goes on to say that even if she likes Paris, she will only marry him if her parents consent to it. 
Now, the phrase in dart mine eye here relates to the idea of Cupid, the god of love, who fires arrows or darts at people. Whoever is shot by his arrow is filled with uncontrollable desire. So this reveals that although Juliet thinks she has some control over who she falls in love with, the reality is that when she sees Romeo, she actually has little rational choice in the matter and is filled with uncontrollable desire. What these quotes also expose is a weakness in the patriarchal model. The idea that a father can prescribe who a daughter should fall in love with. If Juliet has no control over who she can fall in love with, how can Capulet? Another issue with the concept of the patriarchal family is the level of authority a patriarch can command. When he's young, he's powerful. But what happens as he ages? Does he retain the same level of authority? The evidence here suggests that he doesn't. When old Capulet calls for his longsword to fight against the Montagues, his wife says, A crutch, a crutch, why call you for a sword? This tells us that he is ageing, and a more appropriate implement would be one that helps him walk, not fight. His growing weakness also comes into focus when he forbids Tybalt to pursue Romeo at the Capulet Ball. When Tybalt answers that he won't endure Romeo, Capulet says, Am I the master here, or you? The fact that he has to ask the question tells you that his authority is in debt. And although Capulet appears to have asserted his authority, he is, in reality, losing control. And a few lines later, Tybalt says, I will withdraw, but this intrusion shall, now seeming sweet, convert to bitterest gall. Tybalt continues to nurture his grievance against the Montagues until he provokes the fateful and fatal incident in Act 3 when he and Mercutio die. Now finally, the play deals with the question of whether the divisions between the families can be bridged. The answer would seem that sacrificial love, the deaths of the two lovers, will finally reconcile the warring Capulets and Montagues. In fact, Capulet describes the statues of Romeo and Juliet that they plan to erect as poor sacrifices of our enmity. But we should note that neither Capulet nor Montague apologise for their actions or ask for forgiveness. In fact, the word forgive is only spoken twice in this play, once by the nurse and once by Romeo. There's also a sense that the behaviour of the families has affected the natural environment. In the middle of the play, Dawn is personified in bright and optimistic terms using this beautiful metaphor. Night's candles are burnt out and jocund day stands tiptoe on the misty mountain tops. Jocund means cheerful and light-hearted and we get a sense here of a youthful morning standing on tiptoe wanting to begin a new day. Love between Romeo and Juliet animates nature and raises the possibility of a happy unification of the two families. But at the end of the play, the morning and the sun are personified very differently, using these dark and pessimistic metaphors. A glooming peace this morning with it brings, the sun for sorrow will not show his head. The tone at the end is sombre, as befits a tragedy, but peace here is glooming, the sun is sorrowful. These words leave us with the feeling that the fierce interfamilial conflicts that have been played out won't easily be resolved by creating mere symbols of reconciliation. So I hope this brief video has provided you with an insight into the role of the family in this play and it will help you to get greater enjoyment from William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Give a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video and subscribe now so that you never miss any of my future posts.